Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and begin this afternoon's program, um, or perhaps you're tuning in from somewhere where it's evening or the morning, but welcome all. We're so glad that you could join us for the well and the water machine, the history of desalination and fossil fueled water in the long shadow of Arabia's climate altered future with Dr. Michael Christopher Lowe. Uh, my name is Emma Harver, and I'm the Director of Outreach for the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies, and I'm thrilled to be able to open today's program. And I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. This, uh, this afternoon's program is being sponsored by the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies, and it's also being co-sponsored by the Water Institute at UNC Chapel Hill and the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies. So it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Christopher Lowe, um, we will be joined soon by Marwa Koheji, who is a PhD candidate in the Department um, of Anthropology, studying uh, cultural anthropology, and we were very thankful to her for um, putting today's program together. And I actually, I think uh, Marwa might just be joining us now, so I will invite Marwa actually to um, provide this introduction if she is able. Um, thank you, Emma, for uh, starting this meeting. We're delighted to have uh, Professor Michael Christopher Lowe with us today. Professor Lowe is an assistant professor of history at Iowa State University. He specializes in late Ottoman, modern, Middle East, Middle Eastern, Indian Ocean, and environmental history. He is the author of Imperial Mecca, Ottoman Arabia, and the Indian Ocean Hedge, which was shortlisted for the 2021 British Kuwait Friendship Society Book Prize, and which will soon be translated both in Arabic and in Turkish. In 2021, Professor Lowe served as a senior humanities research fellow for the study of the Arab world at New York University Abu Dhabi. While in residence in the UAE, he continued work on several new projects, exploring the entangled and biotechnical histories of desalination technology, water production, infrastructure, energy, and climate change in the Arabian Peninsula and the wider Middle East and more globally. Professor Lowe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, does that, every, everyone can see uh, PowerPoint? Yes, okay. All right, perfect. Uh, so thank you, Emma and Marwa for that uh, generous uh, introduction and for all of your hard work uh, in organizing this event. I'm really grateful to be here with you uh, today. So the first thing that I'll say uh, about this presentation is I'll, I guess I'll go ahead and <laughs> apologize if it is disjointed. Um, this is sort of the first time that I'm trying to put together kind of the beginnings of, uh, of this second book project into a kind of cohesive uh, sort of lecture length uh, presentation. I've published a couple of pieces uh, from this. Part of this comes from my first book. Um, and I'm trying to sort of, you know, work out the direction for the, the second book. So uh, I guess uh, bear with me as I sort of uh, put these pieces together a bit. Um, paradoxically, the history of desalination, I would say, begins not with water, but with energy history. The emergence of desalination technology has a long and, of course, complicated history in the Middle East. While desalination would ultimately become one of the most important manifestations of oil-driven modernization, the rise of desalination technology in the Arabian Peninsula actually predates both American involvement in the region and the discovery of petroleum and the astonishing wealth that it ultimately has generated. Indeed, the first era of desalination in Arabia emerged at the confluence of the late 19th century imperial infrastructures of coal and steam. From the 1850s through the first half of the 20th century, these earlier coal-fired experiments with desalination placed the peninsula in a, let's say, a unique position to capitalize on desalination's Anglo-American-led reincarnation between the 1950s and 1970s. A second coming fueled by oil companies, atomic ambitions, and the strategic interests of the Cold War. But before we get to that, I, I want to sort of start with this sort of earlier 19th century uh, iteration. As On Barak has recently argued, a ghost is haunting the field of energy studies and energy history, the specter of energy itself. Now, what Barak points to is the tendency to misunderstand uh, energy regimes and energy transitions, given that, uh, sorry, that give rise to particular kinds of societies. And what does he mean by this? An energy regime is a kind of collection of arrangements whereby energy is harvested from the sun, directed, stored, bought, sold, used, or even wasted, and ultimately dissipated. 
This basic formula seems, let's say, deceptively simple. The windmill and the water wheel uh, produced a society of feudal lords. Coal and steam produced industrial capitalists in England. And oil, of course, gave rise to petrostates in the Arabian Peninsula. While there's certainly truth to this idea, Barack warns, it overlooks the ways in which energy transitions do not always produce total ruptures. More often than not, the technologies of older energy regimes form part of the basic infrastructures needed to build up a new energy system and shift from one regime to another. In this case, desalination, a key feature of petro kingdoms of the 21st, 20 and 21st century Middle East, were first deployed in the region as an infrastructure of coal and steam. In this sense, rather than understanding the adoption of fossil fuel desalination technology solely as products of oil wealth or Cold War futurism, in reality, it represents a lingering ghost of steamship transportation. Desalination indeed served as a midwife to the nascent petroleum-based states of the region and became deeply embedded in these societies and indeed has survived longer than the original energy regime uh, that it was engineered to service actually passed away. The region that we know now, of course, as the Middle East, partially owes this middleness, if you will, to carbon storage networks designed to fuel the age of steam. In the late 19th century, the British Empire depended on the even spacing of coaling stations spread across the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf to service the increasing flows of steamship traffic flowing between India, the Mediterranean, uh, and England itself. While coal, of course, is uh, the obvious centerpiece of this transportation story, water, on the other hand, has remained a kind of neglected part of the story. Advances in desalination methods went hand in hand with the rise of ocean-going steamships. The first steamers originally used for river navigation could supply their boilers with fresh water from the river around them. When ocean-going steamships were built, they encountered new technical challenges, however. Crews had to either carry fresh water supplies with them or they could use seawater to operate the ship's boilers. However, the use of salt water resulted in the accumulation of saline scales on the flues and bottoms of ship's boilers. In addition to reducing the lifespan of iron boilers, salt water required more fuel to heat, yielded an inferior steam power, and increased the risk of boiler explosions. In order to overcome these problems, between the 1830s and the 1860s, the development of surface condensers and seawater evaporators would eventually make it possible for crews to convert seawater into fresh water for both the ship's boiler and for the crew's consumption. As a result, the condenser became, let's say, a standard part of the steamship and the apparatus of empire across the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, uh, and the Indian Ocean. Now, however, as, as On Barak makes clear, the condenser did not remain stranded at sea. Over time, condensers also made their way to the ports of the Middle East. From as early as the late 1850s and 1860s, the British Empire began to experiment with the installation of coal-fired condenser units in the Eastern Mediterranean and Red Sea ports like Malta, Suez, and Aden, pictured here, where local water supplies were unable to keep up with the new demands of industrial steamship traffic and the increased numbers of foreigners settling in these arid colonial outposts. In the 1860s, several condensers were deployed actually on land in Aden by the British Indian government, as well as private companies such as the Peninsular and Oriental Company, p and and Messrs. Luck, Thomas and Company. While these companies primarily served their own ships calling at port, under normal conditions, both government and private condensers sold water to the general public. And indeed, there's some great documents uh, about Aden, about the sort of pecking order of who got how much uh, distilled water, uh, depending on one's uh, sort of social station. So there's also kind of social and cultural history that can be uh, told out of this as well. Now, in times of drought or emergency, uh, in, in times of water shortage, these units could be called upon to sustain the British Raj's foreign population. It acted as a kind of emergency lifeline of empire, if you will. Now, in the 1880s and 1890s, lengthy military engagements in places like Egypt and Sudan would test Britain's ability to supply its uh, troops with fresh water. Of course, they needed to uh, avoid disease uh, and, and disruptions to their supply chain. At first, steamers were kept in ports like Suez and Suakin solely to generate fresh water from their boilers. Of course, over time, these kinds of emergency security operations became normalized. They became everyday permanent features of the region's infrastructure. 
leading to the installation of land-based systems with larger daily capacities. And by World War I, these British condensers formed a kind of desalinated archipelago from Suez, Port Sudan, Soaquin, Param Island, and Aden in the Red Sea to Muscat, Bahrain, Kuwait, Bashir, and Kerman in the Persian Gulf. Now, at roughly the same time, a different kind of battle, let's say, was being waged in the Red Sea. From the 1860s to World War I, the pilgrimage to Mecca emerged as a global public health crisis. And during this period, Mecca and the Hijaz convulsed with the omnipresent specter of cholera. Thus, while the advent of an industrial steam shipping had opened the floodgates of transoceanic transport, moving both goods and people like never before, it also had the unintended consequence of forging ever faster and more interconnected pathways for the spread of deadly pathogens. Unwittingly, the fusion of colonialism and steam technology had provided the perfect infrastructures and arteries for the globalization of epidemic cholera. At the numerous international sanitary conferences held to address this emerging threat, indigent Hajj pilgrims from British India, the endemic cradle of the disease, were singled out as the most likely bearers of the disease. As a result, the Ottoman Empire was tasked with setting up a Red Sea quarantine system capable of processing potential cholera-carrying pilgrims from the Indian Ocean before they could reach Mecca and spread the disease across the Middle East, Mediterranean, and Europe. So on the slide here, uh, I'm showing a couple of images. On your top right, this is uh, basically one of the sort of yearly commissions that the Ottoman Empire sent to the uh, Hijaz uh, sort of sanitary committee. Um, and then uh, on the top left on your map is marked uh, Cameron's position uh, just north of the port of Hudeida. Uh, in the Red Sea. And of course, uh, on the bottom right, you see a picture of, of the remains of uh, both Ottoman and British uh, built uh, structures. And bottom left, uh, we have a, an Ottoman era map of Cameron Island. Uh, Cameron uh, makes a big appearance in my first book and is really sort of uh, ground zero for thinking about this story of cholera and water. And ultimately, uh, it has its own moment uh, with the salination as well, which uh, I'll uh, say maybe something more about in just a moment. Now, this effort, I would say, brought a, an unprecedented level of scrutiny to both the reliability and the purity of the Arabian Peninsula's water supplies. As a result, in the 1890s, Ottoman officials and public health experts scrambling to grapple with a deadly combination of crumbling conventional water infrastructures, drought, and a raging cholera pandemic began to mimic the British turn towards desalination. So here I've just got a few slides that I'd like to share to kind of walk you through some of the work that I did uh, in the middle chapters uh, of my first book, Imperial Mecca. Um, as cholera ravaged uh, the Hijaz and Mecca repeatedly, um, one of the issues was the actual availability of water supplies. And so the traditional uh, means of supplying water to Mecca, the Ames Zubeda Aqueduct, which you see a map of, an Ottoman map in your top right. In the top left, you see a sort of um, uh, water damaged, ironically enough, um, map of uh, central Mecca's uh, water infrastructures, tanks, cisterns, uh, pipes, taps, et cetera. Um, and then of course, in the bottom uh, left-hand corner, you see the, the water sellers, the water carriers uh, who were selling uh, brackish well water or tank water that had been collected in cisterns. And often this tank water was collected for as long as six months, even a year uh, prior to Hajj season, because of course the water resources of the region are so minuscule, which actually made it quite a, a great uh, breeding ground uh, for cholera microbes. Um, so in an, in an effort to both combat drought and then the omnipresence of disease, we see a document on the uh, bottom uh, right hand of your screen. This was the first document that I encountered where I saw the mention of a need for desalination technology. And the document actually calls for uh, basically steamships like the ones that were present in Suez uh, to supply water for Jeddah and Yanbua, a kind of an emergency lifeline, if you will. Now, not unlike other places, this would eventually become a standard practice, right? You'd have a, an Ottoman steamship outfitted with a distillation unit that was traveling back and forth uh, between Jeddah and Yanbua, basically providing emergency water supplies during Hajj season. Then finally, when we get to uh, the years immediately preceding World War I, in 1914, uh, a Glasgow-based plant, uh, Mearley's Watson, 
uh, was contracted by the Ottoman Empire to build Jidda's first sort of large scale uh, plant for distillation, for desalination. Um, and this is kind of, uh, you know, when I saw this in the Ottoman archives, it became a kind of light bulb, right? Trying to sort of connect something that I didn't expect to see uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century with, of course, the development of these sort of desalination states uh, in the Arabian Peninsula in the latter half of the 20th century. So this was kind of a, a light bulb in the first, first book, uh, if you will. Now, just before World War I, uh, this construction, uh, let's say it was a, a tremendous technical achievement, um, but ultimately it turns out to be a kind of fleeting victory in the long Ottoman struggle with both drought and cholera. Just five years later, Ottoman rule in the region would be completely swept away by the British-backed uh, Arab Revolt of 1916. So 1919 is sort of the end of the Ottoman presence uh, uh, in Medina, all right? So, um, the Jidda plant ultimately provided, let's say, a kind of temporary lifeline to the successor Hashemite and Saudi kingdoms that filled the void left by the Ottoman state in the wake of World War I. Indeed, it provided a kind of miniature a model of the future, a blueprint for re-engineering the entire peninsula's water supply to meet the demands of petroleum-fueled development that emerged in the coming decades. Now, here on the right hand of your screen, you'll see a sort of odd sculpture. Um, and this sculpture is basically, uh, I don't know if it still exists actually in Jidda today, um, but it was basically the remnants of what came to be known as Al-Kandasa, the condenser, this sort of first uh, sort of phase of desalination in Jidda. Um, when the Saudis conquered the short-lived Hashemite kingdom uh, of the Hijaz in 1925, they in inherited the Hajj's chronic water problems, but by then, of course, condenser facilities uh, completed by the Ottomans in 1914 and taken over by British engineers during World War I had become an essential part of daily life and survival for Jidda locals and pilgrims alike. The Ottoman plant uh, would become ultimately known uh, to locals as al kandasa the condenser. Although the supply of distilled water was of course expensive, barely palatable, notoriously unreliable, and made up only a fraction of Jidda's supply, it provided an indispensable safety net, supplementing Jidda's uh, uh, unreliable rain and groundwater supplies. On the left-hand side of your screen, you see a poem by Muhammad Said of Taili, uh, which sort of gives uh, a, a sense of kind of the social history of frustration um, with this uh, sort of uh, nascent uh, desalination technology. Of course, recognizing the impact of the Ottoman condenser in 1926 and 1928, King Abdulaziz Ibn Saud, imported two new submerged tube seawater desalination machines in an attempt to keep pace with Jidda's rising water demands. Thus, even before the arrival of American oil interests and the discovery of commercial quantities of oil in Saudi Arabia in the 1930s, the Anglo-Ottoman infrastructures of Indian Ocean coal, steam, and pilgrimage had demonstrated that the era of carbon-fueled saltwater extraction was already well underway. So, I guess the sort of sequel, the 20th century sort of Saudi sequel to this Ottoman story, um, if we're gonna begin with one man, it has to be Muhammad al-Faisal, Prince Muhammad al-Faisal or Muhammad bin Faisal, who was the second son uh, of King Faisal um, and was of course destined to become Saudi Arabia's quote unquote water prince. While al-Faisal has often been mocked for his ill-fated schemes to tow icebergs from Antarctica to the Red Sea or to build water pipelines from Turkey, some of his crazier aquatic dreams actually did come true. Um, and here, I just want to sort of mention, this is an aside, we can bring it up in the Q&A, but I'm not sure how it's going to fit into this project. It may be part of a chapter or a chapter itself, or it may just be a side project. For several years, I've been working on thinking about uh, this prince and his role in bringing desalination technology to Saudi Arabia. But in 1977, he also... Uh, had this crazy idea to tow icebergs uh, to bring water from Antarctica uh, in ice, right, uh, to Saudi Arabia. And strangely enough, my home institution, Iowa State University, hosted a whole conference on iceberg utilization uh, in 1977. And we see some of the newspaper clippings uh, from in the top right of your screen, Anadwa uh, Meccan Daily, 
uh, and a variety of other sort of, you know, cartoons, quite orientalist, a lot of them from American newspapers. And then on the left hand side of your screen, this is actually a picture of a piece of glacial ice that was flown from Alaska to Minnesota and then shipped in a shipping container in a, a, a sort of refrigerated truck um, and stored in the kitchens of the student union uh, on campus at Iowa State. Um, so this, I have this crazy story to tell about uh, Prince uh, Al-Faisal and icebergs, but uh, we can uh, set that aside for the, the Q&A. Um, this career for Al-Faisal uh, between, let's say, the 1960s and the mid-1970s did have more practical applications. He would build the foundations of what would grow into, ultimately, the world's leading producer of desalinated water. As Al Faisal recounted in a 2015 interview, his first interest in desalination was sparked as a child drinking the condenser water from Jeddah's Al Kandasa plant, we just mentioned a moment ago. Two decades later, while studying uh, uh, at Menlo College near San Francisco, uh, he, the prince found himself really at the epicenter of America's turn to desalination in the 1960s. And the sort of, there was a kind of uh, moment of enthusiasm, enthusiasm, particularly in California for the possibility of sort of saving California from dependence on the Colorado River and dams um, and the possibility of sort of constructing desalination units up and down the California coast. Ultimately, that didn't happen. Uh, we see, you know, uh, some progress on that front, particularly in San Diego, but uh, not quite the vision that the Office of Saline Water had in mind. But nevertheless, uh, Prince Al Faisal, uh, during his studies, visited a multi-stage flash uh, desalination unit built by Aquachem for Southern California Edison's Ventura Power Plant. Impressed by the advances being made in California, he was then armed with the idea that would really ultimately become his legacy. We see a rendering here. Actually, he uh, became in contact with uh, the US State Department uh, and the Department of the Interior and volunteered Jitta as a test plant for Westinghouse and ultimately got US assistance for the uh, construction of the first large scale uh, uh, plant in Jitta. Uh, which ultimately was constructed uh, by a multinational team uh, in 1970. And of course, this becomes really the cornerstone for what becomes, uh, again, the largest network of desalination plants in the world. Uh, approximately 22%, I believe, of all desalination capacity in the world is in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Of course, Saudi Arabia wasn't the only place where desalination was starting to make headway. On the other side of the peninsula, similar kind of symbiotic relationship between empire, hydraulic expertise, and fossil fuels was in unfolding in Kuwait. In 1909, after an especially dry winter, local merchants began importing fresh water from the Shat al Arab to sell to Kuwait cities, townspeople, rather than depending on rainwater or the surrounding areas of uh, brackish wells. In an attempt to break Kuwait's dangerous dependency on water imported from Iraq, Amir Mubarak al-Sabah commissioned the Anglo-Persian oil company to build a condenser plant, which opened in 1919. Although the plant closed in 1924 due to a string of technical difficulties, it was a harbinger of things to come. Between 1924 and the 1950s, Kuwait was forced to continue importing fresh water by boat. In the early 1950s, Kuwait contemplated the construction of a water pipeline to import from Iraq. However, in 1956, the idea was ultimately discarded and Kuwait once again turned its full attention to desalination. Immediately after World War II, Kuwait's oil industry was already edging the country back toward experiments with desalination. In 1946, the Kuwait Oil Company installed a plant which was essentially built around a salvaged evaporator from a World War I era destroyer. This makeshift unit was operated intermittently until the early 1950s when the Kuwait Oil Company purchased their first commercial unit, one of the first 1 million gallon per day submerged tube dis uh, uh, seawater distillation plants in the world. Now, the new plant yielded its first water in 1953, and over the course of the 1950s and 60s, Kuwait continued building more plants and switched from older, less efficient distillation techniques to newer multi-stage flash technologies being pioneered by the US government and produced by Westinghouse. By 1966, Kuwait had temporarily become the world's leading desalinator, reaching a capacity of over 13 million gallons per day at a cost of roughly $3 per thousand gallons. Now, Kuwait's bullish embrace of desalination technology was 
let's say illustrative of the intimate, even symbiotic relationship emerging between oil and water. When American oil men, geologists, and engineers descended on Saudi Arabia and the rest of the peninsula from the 1930s onward, but particularly after World War II, they encountered kings, emirs, and princes eager not just to develop their nation's petroleum resources, but also to secure water supplies sufficient to support their dreams of economic growth and modernization. As Dr. A.L. Miller, director of the U.S. Office of Saline Water observed, Kuwait's early successes offered a kind of template for how desalination might produce more than just water. Addressing a meeting of petroleum refining professionals in 1959, Miller held up Kuwait as the key to understanding desalination's potential role in the oil industry. As Miller pointed out, desalination and drilling were natural allies. On the one hand, the oil industry's enormous water re uh, requirements for both drilling and refining operations had already made, a leading, made it a leading consumer desalination technology. From desalination's use in oil refining operations on the parched Caribbean island of Aruba to seawater conversion for American offshore drilling rigs, Miller envisioned replicating the symbiotic relationship between desalination and oil production already being forged in Kuwait and expanding it to domestic uh, American locations like California and Texas. Although the om ominous from the vantage point of the Anthropocene and today's struggle with global climate change, Miller also puts forward, let's say, a prescient vision of how desalination would also drive increasing energy demands and profits. One thing is clear, he says, the conversion of seawater to fresh water in quantities approaching only a few percent of the current water consumption rate will require expenditure of a staggering amount of energy, either as thermal energy for distillation or mechanical energy for pumping. The energy requirements are so large indeed as we've come to rely more and more on converted sea and brackish water to augment our supplies of natural fresh water, a great new market for fossil fuels will develop. Thus, desalination is not just a product uh, of oil, right? It's a driver of oil consumption. Now, from Miller's perspective, building up interest among oil industry professionals held the potential to speed up the pace of desalination research and development while simultaneously stimulating even more demand for oil. At the same time, however, Miller's enthusiasm for this water energy nexus points to the fundamental problem haunting desalination operations even today. Desalination has always been a creature of carbon, originally a child of coal and steam, but maturing into a global force in the age of coal. It has been profoundly shaped by the costs and ease of access to energy, energy as much uh, as saline water itself remains the key ingredient in the production of desalinated fresh water. Now, I want to sort of give one more sort of set of examples coming out of the UAE. Um, and here you just see kind of a, 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 a small selection of some of the vikriyat or memoirs, sort of uh, oral histories uh, of this sort of period uh, of petroleum's rise in the United Arab Emirates uh, from the 1950s uh, through the 1980s. So one of the tough things I think for me in this project is um, trying to avoid this becoming a kind of top-down story of just empire or oil companies and technology transfer uh, coming from the West. One of the things that I wanna be careful to do really is to make sure that I'm telling a story of how ordinary people experience this dramatic change from more traditional um, uh, water technologies, uh, whether it be wells or uh, fillage systems, cisterns, et cetera, to this uh, more industrialized sort of petroleum driven uh, uh, water industry. So I wanna give an example from some of the stuff that I was working on while I was in, uh, in Abu Dhabi at NYU. Now, while the meteoric growth, sorry, while the meteoric growth of Abu Dhabi from little more than a coastal village to a global capital is undoubtedly a product of the seemingly magical effects of oil wealth, the city is also a product of its somewhat forgotten water resources, both human and infrastructural. As Hamda bint Hamid Al Hamili, uh, who's in the top left of your screen recalls in the hard but sweet days before oil. Abu Dhabi's very existence was made possible by its very precarious supply of palatable drinking water. 
For decades, the men and women of Abu Dhabi had survived on water obtained from digging shallow wells or pits in the sand. The water that it yielded was brackish and barely life-sustaining. And worse still, these temporary wells might last only a few days before the salinity rendered the liquid at the bottom of the well fit for only animals and eventually only for washing. In turn, this meant that new pits would have to be dug to acquire freshwater resources. While this meager supply might have been enough to sustain the seasonal rhythms of purling and the let's say 5,000 or so inhabitants of the town up to the early 1950s, with the discovery of oil in the early 1960s, the burgeoning city's tenuous water supplies would begin to strain under the weight of its increasing labor force and rising population. As al Hamili uh, explains, wells that were dug overnight in what is now the Khalidiyah neighborhood, located between Qasr al Hosn and the Al Batin uh, district, served as the fresh water supply for roughly uh, the 400 Dow fleets uh, that left Abu Dhabi for the annual purling season at the beginning of each summer. So at the bottom left of your screen, you'll see Qasr al uh and uh, sort of donkeys laden with, uh, with oil cans filled with water. Um, and in the uh, right-hand side of your screen, you'll see flage systems carrying water uh, uh, from the oasis of Alain, which I'll come to in just a moment. Um, Prior to the arrival of oil and the rise of widely available desalination and municipal piped water in Abu Dhabi, the process of securing enough potable water to support the region's economic activity was both labor intensive and entailed wildly different gender roles than those imposed after the discovery of commercially viable oil resources. Now, prior to the 1960s, water for Abu Dhabi's purling vessels had to be transported uh, to the dows in water skins borne on the backs of donkeys or carried on poles balanced on the backs of men's shoulders. However, the actual work of digging the wells from which the water was secured was primarily women's work. As Al Hamili recounts, in those days, the majority of the local labor force was composed of the wives of pearl divers, sailors, and other low income workers, as well as widows and di divorcees. In order to prepare the purling fleet for its expedition, teams of 12 to 15 women woke early in the pre-dawn hours to dig shallow wells in the uninhabited dunes of Um al Kufuf, located in what is now Abu Dhabi's Khalidiya district. Armed with metal scoops, the women would dig a shallow well. In the two or three hours that it might take to uh, finish their freshly dug well and have it fill, the women would lay out their water skins in preparation for the laborious purpose of hauling up the water and transferring it to buckets. Once the buckets were filled, the women would carry them on their heads and empty their hall into the Dow's wooden tank, the Funthus. From sunrise to sunset, they went back and forth from the well to the ship and back again. And depending on the size of the Dow, it might take between three and five days to fill a single tank, each tank holding 300 to 500 head holds. As Al Hamili explains, the women were paid one rupee for every four head loads. And while the physical labor of hauling the water was difficult enough, it was actually the maintenance of the wells that scared the women. After a team's well was complete, one woman had to descend into the mouth of the well to shore up its shifting sands uh, and walls. This was especially dangerous work because the wells often collapsed without any discernible signs of warning signs, leaving the women uh, charged with the task, uh, the woman charged with the task buried alive and kicking off a desperate scramble to rescue her. Thus, while the men folk faced extremely da dangerous conditions, and the prospect of a watery grave in the pursuit of pearls and fishing, the women of Abu Dhabi faced their own hazards, just collecting water. Now, in addition to the bodily dangers facing the men and women of Abu Dhabi's pearling operations and economy, al uh, her recollections of the pre-oil era bring into sharper focus the degree to which Abu Dhabi's water insecurity defined its position between the pearling and fishing in the Gulf and the relative hydraulic and agricultural abundance of the date farms and oases clustered around what are now Alain in the United Arab Emirates and Buraimi in the Sultanate of Oman. Thus, after the Dows left Abu Dhabi for the dry summer months, the wives and families of the pearl divers and sailors would depart for Alain or the, uh, or the Liwa oasis, leaving Abu Dhabi populated by a skeleton crew of mostly non-Arab merchants. As the seasonal nature of the pre-oil uh, 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 purling economy of Abu Dhabi's limited uh, hydraulic capacity makes clear. Like the caravans and purling ventures 
the emerging city remained deeply dependent on the oasis and agricultural output fed and nurtured by the underground freshwater located at the foot of Jebel Hafid and the Hajar Mountains. The mountain waters tapped by the underground afflage channels and nearby wells sunk into the water table represented a kind of umbilical cord that sheltered and nourished the coastal Abu Dhabi before and even after the arrival of commercially viable oil reserves. Indeed, even after the first desalination unit arrived during the reign of Sheikh Shakbud in 1962, you see here on the right hand uh, side of the screen, uh, this was the first unit uh, that came uh, and was placed on the Corniche. Uh, you can see in the 1950s on the top left hand side of your screen, this was uh, the Corniche. For those of you who are familiar with uh, the skyline of Abu Dhabi, it's quite a jarring uh, sight to see that Corniche uh, completely empty. So desalination comes and actually didn't work very well. This machine had all kinds of problems uh, when it was delivered in 1962. And ultimately there were no pipes. Uh, Abu Dhabi was not electrified at the time, all right? So all the infrastructure uh, needed to really sort of capitalize on this machine hadn't really been put in place. So in 1962, uh, again, uh, water was still being distributed by donkey-borne oil cans. And those cans might cost a dirham a piece. And at that time, uh, even crude oil itself cost just 70% of that, right? So uh, crude oil costs 70 cents compared to uh, a can of water costing a dollar, you can imagine. Now, the question that I want to answer uh, ultimately in trying to sort of weigh these different kinds of water infrastructures against one another is how did local people experience this dramatic transition from wells, oases, caravans, the flage, to piped water, electrification, and ultimately the massive desalination facilities that came to the region from the 1970s onward. Even well into the reign of Sheikh Zayed in the 1970s, Abu Dhabi continued to rely on uh, Zayed's construction of wells and water piped from the Al Alain oasis. But today, of course, all regions of the Emirates rely on desalinated water piped from its coasts. To describe this journey, I see this kind of as a, an almost absolute reversal of the no normal flow of history. This is essentially taking uh, the region's history and ecology and turning it completely on its head. And this leaves us with some really big questions, not just for the past, but in thinking about the role of desalination and ultimately uh, its fossil fuels that, uh, that are its sort of companion, sort of how this leaves the region, uh, uh, let's say poised to meet the latter half of the 21st century. Now, earlier this week in the midst of its sort of, let's say greenwashed public relations blitz for Expo 2020 in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates announced their intention to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050, 2050, mid-century. Now here, I won't quibble with how realistic their plan actually is. That's not my concern. Rather, I just want to conclude by noting the entangled relationship between desalination and oil consumption in the 21st century. Today, Saudi Arabia, the UAE and its Gulf neighbors have all embraced fossil fuel solutions to address their acute water problems. Desalination has become a defining material feature of life on the Arabian Peninsula, arguably second only to oil. The Gulf's transition toward total dependency on desalination has ushered in an era from which there is no escape. Since the 1970s, oil and water production have become inextricably linked. Not only have oil revenues subsidized impossibly low water prices and high levels of consumption for Gulf state subjects, oil itself has become the key ingredient in the manufacture of the peninsula's water. As of 2010, Saudi desalination operations consumed a mind-boggling 1.5 million barrels of oil per day, representing something like 15% of the kingdom's daily oil production. This energy-intensive solution depends on the basic conceit that oil production and wealth will be able to, uh, let's say, indefinitely keep pace with the development that they have enabled. But unlike the black magic of turning crude oil into government revenue, or private wealth, the production and consumption of desalinated water has fostered an even deeper material dependency. Through the technopolitical alchemy of transforming oil into water, the monarchies of the Gulf have cast an unbreakable spell over their subjects. Mirroring the Arabian Peninsula's petroleum-based ethos of endless energy 
the large scale adaptation of desalination technology has given rise to an equally problematic environmental imaginary of infinite water. With renewable water capacities of less than 500 cubic meters per capita, states like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the UAE suffer from absolute water scarcity. And yet in their fossil fueled hydro imaginaries, renewable water resources have been rendered virtually obsolete. Non-renewable or non-conventional sources have allowed these states to imagine their water supplies as infinitely expandable. If there's no more rain or groundwater to be tapped, more can simply be extracted, processed, and produced. The potential for harvesting the sea has become decoupled from the realities of existing water scarcity. By reproducing the socio-technical procedures created to govern the flow of oil, conceptions of infinite desalinated water have allowed the Arabian Peninsula to ignore and efface the natural limits of this critical resource. Now, each day, dozens of the world's largest desalination plants pump some 70 cubic meters of super salty reject brine back into its waters. As a result, the Gulf is now 25% saltier than normal seawater. With the Arabian Peninsula's groundwater uh, sources decimated and climate change bringing ever higher temperatures, Gulf states are projected to nearly double their desalination capacity by the year 2030. But unless something can be done to address the problem of brine disposal, the water will eventually become so saline that it becomes too expensive to desalinate. In short, the kingdoms of the Gulf are headed not for peak oil, but for peak salt. Mirroring this theory of peak oil, the point at which maximum rate of oil extraction might be reached, peak salt predicts a future when desalination becomes environmentally and economically unfeasible. Not so long ago, the prospect of peak oil seemed like the greatest threat to economic stability of the Gulf and the world indeed. Today, however, as new realities of man-made climate change loom ever larger on the horizon, the fear of running out of oil is slowly being overtaken by the need to make climate adaptations to deal with the consequences of the carbon dioxide that humans have already pumped into the atmosphere. In this sense, the notion of peak salt and peak oil are not so different. Desalination has always been a child of fossil fuels. It's rooted in the same hubris and drive for infinite resources and economic development. And even if a dramatic energy transition can ultimately be made, I remain skeptical that the 20th, uh, 20th century world built by fossil fuel desalination can make the transition fast enough to escape both the global need to move away from fossil fuel consumption and the looming pressures of wet bulb temperatures poised to render parts of the Gulf and South Asia virtually uninhabitable by as early as 2070. Although not what the famous uh, novelist Abdurrahman Munif may have had in mind when he called Gulf states cities of salt, the fragility inherent in his critique of petrostates now has new ecological dimensions with which we must contend. So I I'm sort of playing around with this idea. I'll sort of leave you with this last thought, sort of playing off Abdurrahman uh, Munif's uh, famous uh, Mudun al Mil, uh, or cities of salt. Uh, the idea that these Gulf cities are cities of salt water um, and that there is a kind of fragility in basing the sort of whole of your civilization uh, on this fossil fueled technology. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Lo, for a wonderful presentation and for sharing your work. Uh, the floor is now open for Q&A. So if you'd like, you can just type your questions and I'll uh, read them out loud. We have a question um, from Margaret McGarry. Um, you spoke about one goal of your research being to focus on the consequences that ordinary people faced due to this carbon reliance system of desalination. Before desalination became essential to Gulf society, you talked about how DAOs were utilized for, supp for supplementation of water. Did people see any monetary benefits from this transition to desalination? Did we see any level of migration to coastal towns due to these changes? Along this thread, do you believe that there will be a future, there will be future migration due to ecological changes because of desalination? Thank you for the question. Yeah. So th thank you for your question, uh, Maggie. Maggie's one of my former uh, Iowa State students who has uh, moved on to bigger and better things uh, at the University of Arizona. So it's good, good to see a question from her. Um, so this question about uh, migration and sort of, and this is a really good question actually, to sort of think demographically about the consequences 
uh, of desalination in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, I think sometimes we think of the growth of these, uh, you know, large cities, whether it's places like Abu Dhabi and Dubai or Doha or I mean, any other uh, uh, Gulf city, the population gains, we think, okay, it's just oil wealth. Um, but I wanna sort of say that uh, water was always the limiting factor, right? So if the population of Abu Dhabi was maybe 5,000 in the 50s and early 1960s, that was a consequence of the sort of absolute scarcity and inability of that given location uh, to support more people. Um, so I think that desalination is kind of the driver of the ability to redistribute population uh, in different places in the peninsula, right? So if we looked at a sort of, uh, again, a sort of pre-desalination uh, uh, map uh, of a place like the UAE, you, you sort of see population centers uh, in and around the oases. Uh, so that, that has sort of been disconnected, right? The oases are no longer uh, necessarily needed uh, to sort of have a large agglomeration of population. Um, I think the sort of other end of your question about potential migration in the future is an interesting one um, and one that I've been thinking a lot about, right? So of course, one of the other big topics for uh, uh, sort of thinking about Gulf oil and Gulf labor is labor migration from South Asia, right? If you're in any city in the Gulf, you may have populations, uh, you know, eight in 10 people maybe in Abu Dhabi or in Dubai uh, are coming from some part of South Asia. Uh, one of the things that is disturbing about the sort of heat trends uh, and predictions for a sort of post 2070 world is that both of those regions are sort of equally uh, impacted. Um, and so it raises real questions about where these workers are going to wind up um, if that sort of source of income and set of diasporic connections is, is severed, right? So um, I, I think that both the, the sort of uh, uh, sending population in India and the receiving uh, location uh, are going to be uh, affected in this, in this really dramatic way. So I think you're going to see a redirection of labor markets as a result of that, uh, unless something dramatic can be done. And I actually, you know, everything that I read thus far uh, about these sort of uh, heat issues is that it's fairly locked in. I don't see any dramatic change from the status quo that's gonna get us around those, uh, those heat issues. And in particular for outdoor labor and construction, uh, it, it's a killer. Um, so thank, thank you for that great question. Great, uh, we have another question. Um, two, actually. Uh, the first question is, how do small island states like Bahrain contribute to current efforts to address climate change in the Gulf? Um, I guess you can address this and then I'll read the, the following question. So I, I, I'm not sure sort of how to, to address the sort of sm small island component there. Look, I, I, I will say this, I'm, I'm of two minds. Having spent a little bit of time uh, in the Gulf this past year, I tried to come in with a, uh, a kind of fresh attitude to not be too cynical about sort of uh, climate change efforts or the sort of promises, right? This is certainly an issue uh, for us in the United States and in, in, in Europe as well, making essentially governments making promises that are not at all realistic or not backed up uh, by actions. I actually do think that there is a sort of growing awareness and urgency uh, for the need to either cut fossil fuel consumption or production or to sort of engage with other technologies, carbon sequestration, uh, et cetera. But I think my point, uh, it, my, my overriding feeling is not that the Gulf is sort of uh, doing something nefarious necessarily, although I do think that there are sort of greenwashing efforts Things like Dubai Expo is a sort of commercial rather than a sort of uh, concrete set of aims, uh, in my opinion. Um, but I don't think that these trans transitions can be made quickly enough, right? And so even if you solved the fossil fuel problem, uh, the consumption problem on the, the one hand, you still, for the desalination side, are dependent to keep these infrastructures going on massive amounts of revenue that were previously brought in by fossil fuels. So we can imagine a shift to nuclear, that's certainly happening in a place like the UAE, uh, but can it happen fast enough or to other uh, energy sources? You know, there's a lot of talk about ammonia, hydrogen, those kinds of things. But again, how are you going to sort of retrofit all of these infrastructures in the next 
two, three, four decades. Uh, I think it's sort of a time crunch that is the real issue. I know I didn't really address the uh, question uh, directly uh, in terms of Bahrain, and perhaps Marwa can, can jump in with better answers on Bahrain, but I think the sort of general uh, picture here is it's a matter of, of, of time, uh, not so much awareness of the problem. And thank you. And we have another question from Faye and Naomi. Um, besides economical and, and environmental issues that desalination has presented to the Gulf, what other problems does desalination represent? I mean, I think the, the biggest problem, if, uh, obviously these are economic and ecological problems, um, but I would say, I would highlight maybe um, pricing and consumption, right? Desalination, uh, in part because of the availability of, of cheap energy, um, and because of the sort of bargain that the so-called, you know, rentier states have struck with their uh, subject populations, water prices have been kept extremely low, unrealistically low throughout the region. Obviously, there's some movement on this uh, uh, in terms of water and energy pricing and some taxation things. But again, the pace of change is not nearly fast enough to sort of curb consumption, right? So, you know, if we want to look at UAE, largest carbon footprint and consumption patterns anywhere in the world. And this is, you know, just a, a product of that sort of built in buffer of kind of unlimited resources. And it, it, it's a mindset too, right? It's not that citizens or subjects have done anything necessarily wrong. Um, but the sort of economic incentives have create created those kinds of uh, responses from the, the, the subjects. All right. I have uh, three more questions. So we have a question from David Katz. He's thanking you for a fascinating talk. And his question is, can you speak a bit more about strategies of the Gulf for the Gulf states for sustaining water production post oil? Is it primarily solar or is the assumption that even after the end of world demand for oil, there will be still enough to maintain local demand? And he has another uh, related question. Can you speak to the issue of ownership of the desalination capacity in the Gulf? Are they all government owned or is there a role for the private sector and international parties? So the oil demand question, it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, this is something I haven't, uh, a lot of the labor that I've done thus far on this project is trying to sort of bring together the archival resources um, and then sort of lace in, um, you know, I have, British materials, American materials, BP archives, uh, actually Ottoman materials, and then trying to lace together enough Arabic materials, either from newspapers, magazines, or, or memoirs. So I'm, I'm at this stage, I'm mostly in the kind of uh, building blocks part. Um, and some of these sort of future projections are kind of for the end of the book. So um, forgive me if my uh, prognostications are not, not the greatest, but th the oil demand question I think is a really tricky one, right? Because I think that we have this idea that um, in some near future, oil demand from other parties, the rest of the world is gonna decrease in order to curb fossil fuel uh, emissions, CO2, et cetera. Um, and that that's gonna somehow you know, damage the Gulf states. I have a sort of alternate theory that poorer countries uh, especially are going to continue to use oil in massive amounts. I don't think that there's an end. I think that, you know, we're going to continue pumping oil until the collapse. Um, and because there's sort of no way uh, to incentivize countries that don't have resources to make those massive transitions. So my perception is, and even the sort of promises of net zero from places like the UAE say that they're going to continue to sell oil and that that's part of the plan, right? That they're going to do other things to sort of reach that target. Um, so I actually think that the sort of ecological consequences are going to happen before any of these economic ones actually happen, right? The sort of heat catching up with the region in the latter half of the 21st century, to me, is probably going to be the crisis that catches up first rather than a lack of revenue uh, or a need to switch to some other uh, uh, source to power these, these infrastructures. The thing that I would say, you mentioned solar. Solar, nuclear, these are all in the mix as possibilities. But if you look at the capacity of the many, many, many plants scattered across the region, um, only a very, very small uh, part of those plants is gonna be powered by nuclear or solar. 
Um, there's a lot of talk about so solar in the region, rightfully so, but the actual capacity, installed capacity to use right now is a tiny, tiny fragment. And again, it's not that the potential isn't there, it's how long does it take to scale up and sort of overtake some of these more conventional sources, uh, given the sort of limited constraints that I've mentioned before. Um, so again, it's time crunch more than anything. And if you could please um, follow up with his question on uh, the desalination plants, if they're entirely public owned or privatized. Yeah, so uh, this this situation is sort of a, a, a bit of a, a moving target. Um, and this is, I have a sort of a note, note to self to sort of uh, look into to where this is headed, right? Um, so, you know, the sort of way that things are going uh, in the UAE, right, is uh, an increasing, um, you know, use of, uh, of, of, of corporations like Mubadala, right, to sort of mix this up um, across many, many industries. But essentially, the sort of capacity, um, no matter how you slice it, is, is state-owned. Uh, and that, that mix, I'm not sure, is going to change um, in the long term because of the security issues around that question. Um, but certainly there are private uh, uh, to public partnerships in terms of the construction um, and running of these infrastructures, but not necessarily uh, uh, ownership. Um, but again, this is something that I haven't quite gotten to. Right. Thank you. Uh, and I think with this, uh, we'll close the Q&A. Apologies for those who've asked questions and we didn't have a chance to get to them. Obviously, your talk have inspired a lot of comments and questions. And with that, I'll just like to thank all the attendees and thank you, Professor Lowe, for attending. Uh, thank you for the UNC Center for Middle East and Islamic Civilization and the UNC Water Institute. And uh, with that, we can end this meeting now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>